Good evening. Welcome again to the Bethany and Social Reform Presbyterian Church as we come together for our Sunday evening time of worship. And tonight we're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. So I invite you to open your copies of God's Word to the 12th chapter of the book of Joshua. And we're going to go ahead and read what God has given to us for tonight. But before we do that, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have given us another opportunity to study your Word. To God, we ask in your mercy that your Holy Spirit will continue to use the words of your servant Joshua uh, to bring comfort unto our heart, to challenge us in accordance with our faith, and to remind us that you are our God and that we are your people and that your hand is over us in all things. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now tonight, again, we are in Joshua chapter 12, and is, as is our uh, common work when we come to these longer passages we're going to kind of take the first half verses one through six i'll read that and then we'll read verses seven through 24. so let's go ahead and go to the word of the lord these are the kings of the land whom the children of israel defeated and whose land they possessed on the other side of the jordan toward the rising of the sun from the river arnon to mount hermon and all the eastern jordan plain one king was Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and ruled half of Gilead from Aror, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, from the middle of that river, even as far as the river Jabbok, which is the border of the Ammonites, and the eastern Jordan plain from the Ch Sea of Chinnereth, as far as the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, the road to Beth, Jeshemoth, and south were below the slopes of Pisgah. The other king was Og, king of Bashan, and his territory, who was of the remnant of the giants, who dwelt at Ashtaroth and Edri, and reigned over Mount Ermin, over Salca, over all Bashan, as far as the border of the Gezerites and the Mancathites, and over half of Gilead to the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. These Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel had conquered, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given it as a possession to the Reubenites the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. Now here in the opening six verses, we are reminded of some of the work that had been accomplished before the entrance into the land. These were the areas that Joshua tells us here were given to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. You remember that they had made a covenant with Moses that they would help Israel in the taking of the land if they were allowed to enjoy the blessings of this part of the kingdom that is east of the river Jordan. And we're told here in verse 6 that these things were accomplished by Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel. Notice something there in verse 6 that's worth pointing out. Twice we are told that Moses is a servant of the Lord. And whenever in the Bible we have a double mention of something, especially this close together, that usually means that we're supposed to pay attention to it. Those of you who grew up with a King James Bible will remember the times in which Jesus says things like, Verily, verily, I say unto you. And in those cases, it's because Jesus wants us to pay strict attention to what he's getting ready to say. And the same thing is going on here in Joshua chapter 12. We are told through this message that the servants of the Lord are the ones who will receive the blessing. And this is a callback as we have seen in the previous couple of chapters, to the covenant that was made. The covenant between the people of God and the Lord that they would be his people and he would be their God as long as they obeyed the commands tied into that covenant. And you can go read uh, that in the latter half of the part of, of Deuteronomy. But specifically there, there is consequences laid out, for instance, in Deuteronomy 28, about what would happen if Israel failed to keep the covenant. And that's why when they come in the future, 
to chastise Israel will always refer back to this broken covenant. Why are they heading into exile in Babylon? Why had the Assyrians been allowed to spread the ten tribes to the four winds? Because they had broken the covenant that God had made with them. And here Moses being called a servant of the Lord twice is a positive reinforcement of not the curses as would fall upon Israel later, but the blessings that also were tied into that covenant at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And this chapter is all about rehearsing and reminding one another about what God had done for the Israelites both before they came into the land and after they came into the land. You know, this is kind of like you, you know, back in, in the olden days, uh, they used to set, you used to be able to buy VHS tapes from Sports Illustrated after the end of every uh, season. And the VHS tapes would have a kind of game by game uh, summary of everything that happened in that season. My grandfather would always get me the one for the NFL. And so I would sit and wear that tape out. And I probably know more about what happened in the 1987 NFL season than I do about things I should actually know about. But here in Joshua 12, that exact same thing is happening. The kings that have been destroyed are being noted by Joshua so that the people would look back and remember all the ways that God had protected them, how God had granted them the victory, and how God would provide them safety and comfort in the future. Because that's part of the whole message here of Moses being a servant of the Lord. Moses was a servant of the Lord because he had seen what the Lord had done. This is similar to what Moses does in Exodus chapter 15. In Exodus 15, we have the song of Moses. And the song of Moses begins with these words. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. Why will Moses praise the Lord? Because he has thrown the horse and his rider into the sea. How does Moses know the Lord is his strength in song? Because of the deliverance of God's people out of bondage from slavery. This is another way, another reason why the Lord our God has established the Lord's Day as a unique time in the life of the Christian church. The Lord's Day every week is an opportunity that God has given to us to remember the Sabbath day, to remember the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, to remember the salvation that has been gifted unto us by the Lord God, and also as a time to look forward to the eternal rest that we will have in the heavenly places. And so the, the, the Sabbath day is a foretaste of what awaits us in the celestial city. So in some ways, this passage, Joshua 12, is a type of a Sabbath, an opportunity to rest and consider and think about the victories that the Lord has won. It's one of the reasons why in the book of Revelation, in chapter 1, verse 10, we're told that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And what that means is, is that he was in worship on the Lord's Day. And as he was worshiping the Lord on Patmos, as he was in exile there, he was spending time meditating upon the goodness of God. And the Lord used that time to send the Spirit. And the Lord Jesus, of course, appears to John there and gives him visions. Likewise, in Hebrews chapter 4, as Paul is reminding the people of God about 
the uh, continuation of the fourth commandment there, he speaks of the fact that David, who had been given rest, and David, who had shown people what resting in the Lord looked like, that there also remained a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So this whole chapter, again, is all about Joshua and the people of God resting from their labors, taking a break from the warfare, looking back at all the kings that they had vanquished, and giving thanks unto the Lord. We can hear uh, something like the ninth psalm being spoken of by Joshua and his men in this chapter. Psalm 9 verses 1 through 5 says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. For you have maintained my right and my cause. You sat on the throne judging in righteousness. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. These are a lot of kingdoms that God has allowed his people to win the victory over. And what we're going to talk about, the significance of there being 31 kings in all. But what we see happening is, again, Joshua repeating these names. And every time he says one of these names, something that's going to pop into his head is how specifically the Lord had allowed Israel to be gifted and granted the victory. And this is something that we see the psalmist do in Psalm 119. How many times do we hear David say in Psalm 119 that he's going to meditate either on the works of the Lord or on the law of God? Well, when he's talking about the law of God, he's not just talking about the 613 laws that are in the uh, Mosaic uh, uh, books, in the first five books of the Bible. When he talks about the need to meditate upon the law, he's also talking about the revelation that he has received of the Lord's work up until that point. So David meditates on, on God's deliverance of Abram out of the land of Ur. He meditates upon the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. He meditates upon the covenant line being continued in the days of Seth. All of these events are part and parcel of what enables someone like David, someone like Hannah, someone like Samuel, faithful men and women of the Old Testament, to persevere in the face of whatever it is that's in front of them. They know that the Lord has watched over their forefathers and so he'll watch over them. Why can Hannah pray like she does for a son from the Lord? Because she knows of the prayers of other women who have come before her. And she knows the Lord has answered those prayers. How does she know, for instance, that the, one, that the sons of the Lord will be kings, that they will rule, that they will reign? Because, again, of what she has learned from the revelation of the Lord up and into the day in which she is praying these prayers unto God. And so there's great comfort that the Christian can receive from going back and looking at a passage like Joshua 12 and seeing the vanquishing of the enemies of the Lord. Because one of the things we know because of the promises we have in the Lord Jesus Christ is that the enemies of God will receive their judgment. The Apostle Paul, again, in the book of Hebrews, reminds us that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And even though we might not see it with our own eyes, may not experience it in our own days, we know that even if it's not on this earth, that judgment will come to the wicked. And we can rest and have peace in that knowledge that no matter how much the enemies of the church, the enemies of the gospel, attempt to to overthrow the bride of Christ, we know the promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against her. And so we are to, again, walk by faith and not by sight. 
And that's what that passage really is getting to in 2 Corinthians. And if we lived in accordance with what we see, then we would always be fearful. Because not only does doubt seep into our heart when we walk uh, by eyesight, but we begin to have the seeds of doubt sowed in when the flesh begins to take over what is the Spirit's work. Now, Paul, in his letter to the church at at Colossae, says something similar in, in Colossians 2, 6, and 7. He says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Again, we who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, who have been made new creatures in Christ, who have been given this new life, have been saved into something. We have been adopted into the family of God. So stories like Joshua 12 are our stories. They are our family's history. You know, and one of the things I really enjoy doing, and I know many of y'all do as well, is going back and learning stories about your ancestors, how your great, great, great grandparents came to the United States, or your great grandparents came to the United States, and why they immigrated uh, to the colonies or to wherever. And that's an important part of understanding who you are. And so think about what is said here, beginning at verse 7. And these are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel conquered on this side of the Jordan, on the west from Belgad and the valley of Lebanon, as far as Mount Halak and the ascent to Seir, which Joshua gave to the tribes of Israel, possession according to divisions, in the mountainous country, in the lowlands, in the Jordan plain, in the slopes, in the wilderness, in the south. Listen to all of those details, whether it's the high mountains or the low plains, whether it's by the sea or by the river whether it is in the south or in the north, in the east or the west, all has fallen under the hand of the living God. And that's because it already belonged to the living God. Remember what I said earlier about the 31 being an important number. Well, let's go ahead and finish this uh, portion of, of, of reading the Lord's word here. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the king of Jericho, one. The king of Ai, which is beside Bethel, one. The king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king of Jarmuth, one. The king of Lachish, one. The king of Eglon, one. The king of Gezer, one. The king of Deborah, one. The king of Geder, one. The king of Horma, one. The king of Arad, one. The king of Libna, one. The king of Adalim, one. The king of Makeda, one. The king of Bethel, one. The king of Tepua, one. The king of Hepher, one. The king of Aphek, one. The king of Laparon, one. The king of Madden, one. The king of Hatzor, one. The king of Shimron, Meron, one. The king of Ashpeth, one. The king of Tanak, one. The king of Megiddo, one. The king of Kedesh, one. The king of Jokinim and Karma, one. The king of Dor and the heights of Dor, one. The king of the people of Gilgal, one. The king of Terza, one. All the kings, 31. And again, those kind of things can get repetitive. And we have a tendency sometimes to, to, to tune out when the Bible repeats things like that. But meditate on each one of these victories. Again, these are 31 kings that the Lord has allowed his people to vanquish. These kings in the years prior to Joshua coming thought they were hot stuff. Thought they were the most important people in their region. Thought they were strong. Thought they were invincible. And all it took was a ragtag army of former slaves to take them out and remove them from the face of the earth. But of course, this wasn't any minor army. This was an army led by the king of heaven and of earth. Remember, how many kingdoms does the king of heaven and earth serve? He only serves one king. Whereas these are 31 kingdoms. And what do we know about the size of the land of Israel? It's about the size of the state of Connecticut. So these are 31 kings in a state the size of Connecticut. There is much division in the land. There is much keeping them from properly uniting together. Whether it's pride, whether 
it's uh, uh, foolishness, whatever it might be, these kingdoms are divided, and it made it easy to pick them off. In, in, in a general sense. Of course, we know the Lord won the, each victory. But this helped in that regard in, again, a temporal sense. But the kingdom of the Lord is one. And this is the strength of the church, the strength of the kingdom of Christ. We are one faith, one baptism, one kingdom under heaven. And we make ourselves easy prey for the beast who walks this earth, when we divide over things that are not worthy to be divided over. Remember Jesus' prayer in John 17. He prayed to the Lord that we would be one. He prayed that we would be united together in Christ. But unfortunately, that has not been the case, has it not? Even when the church had a veneer of unity prior to the days of the uh, division of the church into the east and the west in the year 1054, there had always been little pockets. And again, this is the danger of what Satan does when he sows division within the church. He allows us to be easy prey for the world. It's one of the reasons, again, why it's so important for the church to be united, why the church shouldn't uh, uh, you know, uh, not just be divided, but why the church should see no problem with division. And division is something that should always seek to be healed. Because, again, this is the picture of, that we are to show the world. Remember, something that Israel was told that they were supposed to uh, provide for the world was a city on a hill. They were to be an example to the nations around them of the wisdom and the goodness of God. And, of course, Israel was not that. And, unfortunately, the church hasn't always been that either. And so we need to learn something from the midst of the failures of these pagan kings. We need to seek to be united together. Again, that unity must be in Christ. It cannot be just a paper unity. It has to be a unity in mission. It has to be a unity in gospel. And it has to be a unity for a future reality. Another way to think about this is to remember what it is that we're told about the kingdom that we have received. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 through 29 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. One of the reasons why there is division in the land is because of hubris, because of arrogance, because of pride, because of man-made tradition. And these things must be done away with if we are to see Unity in the body. And that's something, again, a, a, a passage like Joshua 12 is pointing us towards. Because these tribes, which are 12, right, are united together in one purpose. First, they're united under the move towards the promised land. And what do we see happen in the wilderness journey when the people allow their own pride and wickedness to get in the way of the purposes of the Lord? Well, that whole generation is left in the wilderness because they sought themselves rather than the Lord. This gets us back to where we're going to close tonight. But remember what uh, we said at the beginning about this testimony of Moses being the servant of the Lord. And if we want to see the glory of God laid out, then we must understand ourselves to be thus, to be servants of the Lord. And because we have been united together in the likeness of the death of the Lord Jesus. And if we've been united together in his death, and if we've been united together in the likeness of his resurrection, then most assuredly we should be able to sing the psalm that every ARP knows by heart. Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. 
That must be the clarion call of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this day as it should be in every day. That we who are servants of the Lord should be again brought together in the mercies of the Lord forever. And we're to understand again the Lord has brought us together for a larger purpose and that purpose is not our own. That purpose belongs to the Lord our God. We must keep him not just central but primary in everything that we do as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because again, we should be a witness to the fallen world around us of what unity looks like. And part of that is uh, why the church struggles so much when it comes to seeking converts. Because the church is just, is just as disorganized and disunited as the world around it. If you're seeking peace and comfort, then you are looking for a place where you can experience these things. And the church should be a place where this is true. And this is the reality. So something worth praying for this week as we, again, close our time together in Joshua chapter 12, is we should be praying for the unity of the body. Not just unity here at Bethany, not just unity in the ARP, not just unity in South Carolina, but unity in the worldwide church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, that unity cannot be faith. It cannot be just for appearance's sake, but it must be grounded in this servanthood of the Lord, of this following what the Lord has revealed in his word and being willing to submit ourselves to what God has said. For this is the blessing and this is the picture of what we see here in Joshua 12. As they gather together and as they remember the Lord's work, as they rejoice in the goodness of God, they see how far the Lord has brought them and they are preparing themselves to continue in this work. May the Lord be with you this week and may the Lord guide you in his labors. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we seek to be united in Jesus Christ and as we seek to be united in the body and blood of the Lord, to God we ask in your mercy that you would not just help the church, but that you would move us to be reconciled, move us to see genuine, real unity within the body of Christ, that we might show forth that unity to the world around us and they might see the blessings of grace and of love. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.